Rogers states the point best, quote, the conservative's king, the conservative's king, was stabilized and crystallized in that extracted phrase, the content of our character. With powerful moral confidence, they turned it against what they saw as the post-king course of the Civil Rights Project, against busing for racial equalization, against affirmative action in college and professional school admissions, against the minority set-asides that black city governments were promoting, against consideration of race in voting district apportionment, against counting, considering, or officially noting race at all. Ironically, King's words in the hands of conservatives would become the basis to turn a blind eye to the legacies of white supremacy and the persistence of racial inequality. For some, the holiday would effectively wash our national hands clean. And any attempt to use race talk in public policy debates to acknowledge the significance of racial and cultural differences in the public domain would now be subject to the claim of reverse racism. To interpret King in this way is to kill him again. It requires that we frame him not in the light, not in the light of his lifelong witness, but in terms of a moment, a sentence even, that confirms who we take ourselves to be as a nation, not those powerful words that challenged our very self-conception. It's been deodorized. It's been sanitized. King makes you feel good about yourself. Doesn't unsettle your beliefs. He confirms your prejudice. Mm. My, my, my. Oh, yeah, I'll take some more. Y'all all right? In the last year of his life, King spoke out against the Vietnam War. He knew the dangers of such a position, right? It would threaten the traditional coalitions that supported the civil rights movement and end his relationship with President Johnson. His momentous decision, and I use momentous here in the William James sense of momentous, right, in that wonderful essay, The Will to Believe. His momentous decision to break his silence was rooted in a moral commitment which extended the principles of justice to those who were not his immediate neighbors. It's an extraordinary exercise of the moral imagination. King understood that the black freedom struggle was not limited to black people, that our struggles for dignity and self-respect involved a broader consideration about the transformation of the United States into a more equitable society, a freer society. King understood the cost of speaking out. Just two years earlier, in August of 1965, speaking at the annual convention of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, King called for an end to the war and urged America to deploy its forces to help, quote, rebuild some of the villages which had been destroyed, end quote. King was roundly criticized by allies within the Civil Rights Movement for linking the struggle with international concerns. He was vilified in the press, <clears throat> told that he had no right to speak about international concerns. The Cold War had effectively left little room for the internationalism that defined African-American politics through the mid-1940s. Any effort to connect the civil rights struggle with US foreign policy was taboo. And most believed the fragile coalition of forces that sustained what was now a fledgling movement would be jeopardized by King coming out against the war. In light of these concerns, he would wait two years before fully addressing the Vietnam crisis. In the interim, he saw what? What did he see? The physical and spiritual destruction of war. And he witnessed the erosion of democratic life at home. Commenting on Julian Bond, who spoke right here, who was denied his state legislative seat in Georgia because of his opposition to the war. King wrote, never before had the right to question our foreign policy been so severely thwarted. He went on to say that our nation 
was approaching a dangerous totalitarian periphery where dissent becomes synonymous with disloyalty. King saw dead Vietnamese babies and mangled bodies. He saw broken men return home. He saw a nation whose soul was truly in need. He would say, if America's soul becomes totally poisoned, quote, part of the autopsy must read Vietnam, end quote. So on April 4th, 1967, one year to the day he would be murdered, King delivered his Vietnam speech. He noted that Vietnam was but a symptom of a far deeper malady within the American spirit and a radical revolution of values was required to save the nation. In the pulpit of Riverside Church in New York City, King preached, quote, I am convinced, these are his words, not mine. I am convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, that we're just playing this out. We as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin the shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives, and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. This is not the king celebrating with a coke and a smile. He went on to say that a true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. On the one hand, we are called to, be, to play the good Samaritan on life's roadside, he said. But that will only be an initial act. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It is not haphazard and superficial. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. A true revolution of values, King said, will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth. I wonder if John Maynard read this. King noted, quote, the Western arrogance of feeling that it has everything to teach others and nothing to learn from them is not just a true revolution of values will lay hands on the world order and say of war, this way of settling differences is not just. Obama had to go through all, all sorts of contortions in order to justify his acceptance of the Nobel Peace Prize and his execution of the war in Afghanistan. It has been noted over and over again. Y'all all right? You sure? Uh, it has been noted all, over and over again that this particular king is obscure in our celebrations of his life. King's anti-war stance has been ignored. <clears throat> his fight against poverty at home and imperialism abroad dismissed as a quixotic chase after windmills. And this is not simply the result of conservative appropriation of civil rights language. King's de-radicalization is in part a consequence of the kinds of stories black folk tell. Today, no one in our national history embodies the, the notion that racial equality is a U.S. national imperative than Martin Luther King. And as Nikhil Singh notes, these sorts of invocations of King bind the fortunes of African Americans to the mythic status of the U.S. nation state and to its dominant systems of belief, that of liberal individualism and democratic capitalism. But again, the complexity of King, indeed the complexity of black life itself is minimized in such a movement. In some ways, it domesticates the powerful critique of American hubris evident in the black freedom story. King's public success is bound up with the alignment of his prophetic challenge of the state with the broader myth of America as a shining city on the hill, as the fulfillment of a project, and as the completion of destiny. 
King becomes in this holiday the latest character in a story of American perfections. And with Reagan's signature, he joins with others like Lincoln as a new founding father, enabling Americans to embrace their progress as a more inclusive and tolerant people and to affirm once again their inherent goodness. Oh, but when we look around the nation, what do we see? Oh, if we were to go into the neighborhoods of Rochester, what will we see? If we were to take a tour around the south side of Chicago, what would we see? If I were to take you to the dark and dank sides of New Orleans, what would you see? If we were to go to the deltas of Mississippi, what would you see? You would see black people toiling in misery. But if I were to take you into the barrios of LA, take you into the southwest of Texas, what would you see? If I were to take you into certain spaces in Arizona, certain spots in certain parts of California, what would you see? You would see brown people suffering day in and day out. If I were to take you into the mountains of Appalachia, take you to certain spots and places in Wyoming, if I were to take you to certain places in Arkansas, and Alabama, what would you see? You would see poor white brothers and sisters suffering under the brunt of greed in the context of a society that has allowed democracy to be captured by corporate interests. What would King say? His vision would not be an affirmation of the status quo. He would not come to tell us how good we are. That's not the prophetic voice. He would come to unsettle us. He would come to challenge us. He would come to give voice to the enduring power of democratic ideals, not because those ideals are America's possession, but because those ideals stand for the affirmation of the dignity and standing of every human. Christian professor could preach, could he? <laughs> but King, in the context of the holiday, Obama, no, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> this King-centric account of the civil rights era Nikhil Singh writes, is a wonderful historian, wrote a book entitled Black as a Country. This King-centric account of the civil rights era has become central to the civic mythology of racial progress. Beginning with the decision in Brown v. Board of Education in 54, what might be termed the short civil rights era, Singh writes, is imagined to have taken place primarily in the Jim Crow South from the mid-50s to the mid-60s in a series of social movements to desegregate black life and register black voters. And you know the story. A weary rear Rosa Parks wouldn't get up. And then the emergence of these well-dressed black students who would set, set in. And then all of it culminated with the March on Washington. The passage of landmark national legislation and social policy Civil Rights Act of 64, Voting Rights Act of 65, followed by Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty. According to Singh, this brief period is now viewed as the apex of the historical arc of black struggles for citizenship in the United States. The moment when questions of black political participation and civic equality become central to U.S. civic identity, a long overdue vindication of what King once called the amazing universalism of the founding documents in the American world. But this version of the black freedom struggle and of, King, and of King's prophetic witness narrows the scope of the black freedom struggle, banishing other forms of radical engagement from view. And with this absorption into a moral discourse of colorblindness, it has become an even more narrow frame. What are the implications of this reading of King in our moment with our first African American president? I'm coming to a close so we can talk. In some ways, we are witnessing the end of black America as we know. 